Calgary. So you just said that. Yesterday, my sister had a birthday party for Betty, and she couldn't even get her friends to bring their kids to the birthday party. She was paying for kids to come to the playground place. So, I mean, how do you even get kids to do anything? They don't buy I understand. Bikes, they don't play. Yeah, people no. do anything. Yeah. Most people don't do anything. And that's one of the hardships that we have. I mean, I ended up here because it was for me. I that's right. It's you can find people that are looking for themselves. I, and I agree with that. We've got, it. We've got to do it that way. I, I'm on board. All right, everybody here has been here a long time. And they've all reached out to somebody. Mm -hmm. Nothing's I happened. People. Well, week, out, week in, week out, we say, get more people. What do you want these people to do? Here we go. Stay on the corner? No, here, here, here we go. I'm glad this is coming this way. This is great. This is not on script, by the way, folks. This was not my message. Are you but here's my message. No, we're on board. And here it is. The controversy that we're going to read, and I'm going to do something that is not typical. I'm going to read out of the King James Version. And then I'm going to read out of the NIV version, and here it is. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. We're only going to look at one verse. And most of you have learned this one if you've been in the church any length of time, and it says this. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now that sounds pretty easy, but if you look in the NIV version... Proverbs 29, verse 18. Proverbs 29, 18 in the New International Version says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. And what I want to focus on for the moment is there's a big difference in most people's eye between vision and revelation. Vision is what we can see. Now, I asked a question before we came online. I asked everybody in the room, did you notice anything different about Pastor Will? Right? Yeah. And, I, and people said, are you wearing socks? And I went, no, because I don't wear socks. One person mentioned that I'm not wearing a tie. And I said, well, during Christmas I wore a tie, but a lot of times I don't. One person mentioned a watch, which I've had for a couple months. I've got to tell you. When we put that cross up, it was three weeks before people noticed it. Three weeks. When we put those lettering up, it was a couple weeks. And by the way, for all of those of you who were wondering what's different of Pastor Will, some people said weight gain, some people said weight loss, okay? I'm trying to make sure that I got everybody's answer because everybody's answer is important, okay? No, I did not get a haircut, although I have had one recently. No, I did not change my glasses. No, my mustache is not longer. It might be better true because I got a new razor for Christmas. But it's not, it's still there. The truth of the matter is. The truth of the matter is, there's nothing new. I haven't changed at all. And the thing about it is this. Where there is no vision, it says people perish. As opposed to where there is no restraint or where there is no revelation, people throw off restraint. Here's what we need to do. And one of you asked, what do we need to do? I'm going to tell you where it starts. And it's going to be difficult. Now, how many of you know that when, things, when somebody says it's going to be difficult, half the people turn their ears off? Can you believe that? Sure. Yeah. When I said, if I say it's going to take you out of your comfort zone, half the people turn their ears off. If I listen, and I have listened, and I do listen, and the Lord listens, we are in hard times. We can't get people to do things for good things. Christmas giving is down. Salvation Army is having to cut back. They're good. They are known. They've been good for years. Very few people scam. When I was in college 35, 40 years ago, one of the jobs that we had, they went to this Christian college that I attended and they asked for recruits. They would pay you fifty or thirty dollars a day housing and food. And all you had to do for eight hours a day was ding da 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 ding. Thank you. Ding da ding da ding da ding. 
and they made enough money to cover that and pay their bills. Today, they're not making it. And it's easy and fair and maybe even understandable to say we live in a post-Christian era. People get their entertainment on TV. I'm going to tell you, if I could entertain, if I did entertain, if we were here and I had some catchy phrase to make everybody think that on Facebook they were the thing, we would have thousands of viewers. If I told everybody that they're good and all right and that everything's good and God's your buddy, viewership would go up. But the truth is, if we're dealing with sinners, if we're dealing with people who don't even know that they're sick, sin sick that is, it's awful difficult to get them to come. Now see, we didn't take the offering and there's, there wasn't a reason other than the service was going that way and I'm, I'm happy that way. Joanne had told me there were two offertories she was looking at and I didn't get a bulletin this morning. Which one did you pick, Joanne? Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. She gave me two and I went, both of them are good. I kind of wish you'd been the other one. Be thou my vision. Be thou my vision. She didn't know what we were talking about and I, I left it to her because the Holy Spirit's got to talk to each one of us. How do we do that? How do we make the whole, how do we allow, we can't make them, how do we allow the Holy Spirit to come in and talk to us? How many of you believe the Holy Spirit does talk to you? How many of you believe that the Holy Spirit pushes his will in a Christian's life, not jumping over free will? But the Holy Spirit is in you telling you what way to go. Do we believe that, really? How many of us believe that the church needs to survive? I'm going to tell you this. The church is going to survive. Now, whether this bot part of the church survives, different story. Churches have lifespans. Pastor, you're not painting a rosy picture. What I'm painting is this. Where there is no vision, where there is no revelation from God, it's doomed to fail. How do you find the vision and revelation from God? How many of you would like God in a big, deep bass voice, kind of like Charles Heston, to go, Thus saith the Lord, I want you to do this. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Okay? Scare you half to death. If you're not sure if it would scare you, look in the book of Isaiah. Okay? If it would it would scare you half to death because think about it. Samuel the prophet was a little boy, and that's exactly what happened. And he kept saying, Eli? And Eli, shut up, kid, go back to bed. I heard a voice, and finally Eli realized it was God talking to this little boy, and he says, when he says, say, here I am, talk. Pastor, I would love it if that big voice would say, I want you to go here. I want you to talk to this person. They'll be wearing a white carnation because nobody wears white carnations anymore. And they're ready to hear the word of God. That would make it so easy. Our first song this morning was We Three Kings of Orient Are. Bearing gifts, we traverse afar. We followed the star, and now I'm making up words. Okay. <laughs> they followed a star. How many of you have ever looked up at the stars? Do you look up at the stars? <coughs> there was a really cool meteor shower last week. Clouds were right to cover go. They followed a star. Most of us would be like, cool star. But they saw it and they said that it meant something. And they followed, it, and God used a star. How many of you would like God to use a star? Skywriting. Yeah. 
a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud by day. How many of you would like that? If the cloud goes forward, we go forward. If the cloud goes left, we go left. And wouldn't it be great if the cloud or the pillow of fire landed on some, not on, above somebody's house, and you went, oh, okay, God, I'll talk to them. Make sense? God has done that. God used the star. He's used the clouds. He's used the sky. He's used the fire. He's used a chariot. Where there is no revelation, there's no restraint among the people, and the people die. Pastor, you've given me ways that God has spoken in the past, but I'm not in the past. I'm in 2020. Fair? I'm in a hard neck, stiff necked people. And I could probably call on each one of you and I could say, is it tough where you work because of some of the people that are there? And many of you could tell me horror stories. Of course, when I worked secularly, I could tell you horror stories. When I worked in other churches, I could tell you horror stories. Well, Pastor, we're not there. We're in 2020. What do we do? How do we go about this? You keep asking us to do things like pray for one more. So here's the question. That's the easiest part of this whole thing. How many of you, honestly, I'm not asking you to show hands. <clears throat> talk, to me in the, talk to me afterwards if you want. How many of us are actually Every time we pray, or almost every time we pray, are praying, and Lord, put one more in our house. How many of you believe God can do that? That's the question. Do you believe God can do that? Could God, right now, at... Here he is now. <clears throat> I didn't know where that came from. At 11.38 on a Sunday morning, could 50 people walk through this door? God could make it happen, couldn't he? Before service started, there was a very upbeat song based on secular music. And did you listen to the words? Mm -hmm. Pray now, it's a lost art. Get your day, day underway. Pray now. Get faith. God is listening, you know, but only you can start praying, though. Start with prayer. Why am I pushing? Why am I being such a hard case about the prayer vigil? Because there's only 20 of us, and I have 16 slots. That means that almost everybody in this room has to sign up for it to be successful. But you know what? Success isn't going to be measured by if the slots are filled. That's not going to make it... A, we can fill every slot and have people signing down the sides. And if during that prayer time, we only run through our laundry list, it's not going to mean a hill of beans. If we take time and listen in that prayer time. What do you mean, Pastor? God, I'm going to take five of my 15 minutes or three of my 15 minutes, or two of my, my 15 minutes, and after I've said, God, I want, we need one more person in this church, I'm going to let you tell me who that person is. Not unfair. Now, here's my question. If God tells you who they, who it is, don't you think God is prepping them? I'm going to let you know, and I'm going to be very transparent right now, because we are so far off script, it's not even funny. But here it is. God told me about this church eight months before they gave me an interview. In fact, a year beforehand, I had talked to Pastor Noel and said, hey, what's going on with the church there? And I'm going to tell you, two things had to happen. 
Number one, God had to prepare you people for me. Who would want a pastor who's bald, overweight, and doesn't wear socks? Man, what a weirdo. But God also had to prepare me for you all. And it took time. And I'm going to tell you, the board had other offers, and they looked at other offers, at least if they were smart, in eight months you should have. But God was setting you up for me and me up for you so that we would mesh. And I'm going to tell you, I love you all. And it's because I love you that I have to stand up here today and say, how are we going to do it? We're going to do it through a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And prayer. And working with each other. And going away from the people that we normally go to. How many of you would love to have a church filled with doctors, lawyers who all tithe? <laughs> One or two. Yeah. I mean, two doctors, two lawyers, two, two college professors, they all tithe. We'd make money. Our financial statement would look a lot better. But if it's by our own revelation and our own vision and not God's, it's not going to work. And so far, God hasn't drawn him in. God hasn't drawn him in. Okay, Pastor, why? I don't know. I'm going to be very transparent. I don't know. We've done things for kids. We've done things for teenagers. We've done things for college students. And the truth of the matter is, none of them have come back with good fruit. Fair? Our last Bible school, we had 12 adults for five kids. What's wrong with this picture? And everybody invited him. Yeah. It wasn't for lack of trying. But here's the question. How much time have we spent? We're peddling as fast as we can, folks. How many, how many of you are peddling as fast as you can? Be honest. How many of you are doing multiple jobs because they need to be done? We're peddling as fast as we can, but the problem is we got to get the real power source. Sometimes we got to step out of the way we see it, how it should be done, and let God show how he wants it done. Here's how it goes, very simply. We're going to start with the prayer vigil. We're going to pray. We're going to take time and find out who God puts in our way. We're not going to use our own filters. How many of you know you put filters on your eyes? How many of you know? How many of you know that I look better when I'm talking to you folks and I'm doing a picture? Yesterday, my wife took a picture of me playing with my mother, with my mom. We we made an impromptu trip down to Maryland to see my mom, and Joy and the kids came. So there's my mom, me, and AJ. And of the three of them, my mom is in her 80s. AJ is coming up on his first birthday. And guess who looks the worst of them all? <laughs> I do. Because the picture doesn't show the reality. Any more than a picture of our church building shows our church. And if God is preparing his people to do the work of bringing in. He's also preparing the people to come in. Years ago, I was the Sunday school superintendent long before I became a pastor. And our church had, was growing, and we were going to two services, and we were trying to figure out how to have Sunday school and church, and Sunday school and church, do we put it church, Sunday school, church? Do we put it Sunday school, church, Sunday school, church? Do we put Sunday school, church, second church? There's a million and one observations. And we had a meeting with a gentleman who was running a church of over a 1,000. And he gave me the most unusual words I've ever heard. And he said this. He said, you want him to figure it all out? Because we were sitting there going, we want to have two Sunday schools and two churches, but we can't ask the Sunday school teachers to do two services because then they don't get fed, and that's not fair. 
He said, here it is. One Bible verse. Pray the Lord of the harvest sends the workers. See, the story behind that verse was the disciples were standing there and they were saying, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to bring people in. Tell us exactly what we're asking today. And he looked out and said, don't you see the fields? They're white with harvest. They're ready to be pulled in. And they looked out and they went, it's not harvest time. It's spring or winter. It's not fall. He said, pray the Lord of the harvest sends the workers, brings the workers, makes the workers happen. Why? You're the workers. And if we don't see the crop, if you don't see your neighbor, and this sounds harsh to people on Facebook, I'm sorry, but it's the truth. If you don't see your sinner neighbors, your sinner friends, your sinner co-workers as potentials to learn about Jesus, you've missed the boat already. Now, if you pray, Lord, show, give me your eyes to see people. I'm going to tell you, it's going to get weird. You're going to be sitting at dinner. And all of a sudden, the waitress is going to tell you your life story. Why? Because it's happened to me. You're going to invite somebody to church and you're, they're going to go, but I don't have nice clothes. You're going to go and you're going to talk to somebody and they're going to say, I can't come to church because I have a different political view or a different sexual view or a different dependency view. And the first thing, they're going to be shocked that you speak to them. And secondly, they're going to say they can't. I'm going to tell you, I had the most eyes widened before I became a pastor because I walked up to somebody and I said, hey, you need to come to church. And they went, pastor, I can't. I, but before I was pastor, it was, will I can't. I said, why? They said, I'm wearing my best clothes. And they worked on a dock. And their best clothes smelled like fish. And there were holes everywhere. And I said, I'll make a deal with you. See, I was working in a machine shop at the time. So I'll make a deal with you. If you come, number one, call me and tell me you're coming. I'll come pick you up. They said, no, we have our car. Actually, he said he had a bicycle. He wasn't allowed to drive. I said, well, tell me what you're wearing, and I'll match you. He said, you see my best clothes. So, so tell me what you're wearing. I'll match you. And he said, why would you do that? I said, because so many people are going to be shocked to see me dressed that way that they're not going to care about you. We have to make it easy for people to come into the church. How do we do that, Pastor? Well, it'd be great if we had enough money that we could give a, do a giveaway every week. I guarantee if we had a lottery and had, had an iPad up here, people would come in. I guarantee you if people came, you know, when you come through the door, you get a gift ticket, and if they pull the hat, you get the iPod, I guarantee you people would come. See, Jesus had that too with the feeding of the 5,000, and a couple days later they came back and said, hey, give us more. Give me, give me, give me. I said, no, 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 no. It's not all that. It's just food. Pastor, you've not done the offering. We didn't finish the morning psalms. Why? Because that last song, I'm desperate for you, broke me. I'm going to tell you that right now. We did not follow, we did not do status quo because my heart's broken right now, folks. Because the truth is, there are 10,000 people within a half mile of us. How many of you know all? <laughs> that was a trick question. I didn't raise my hand. Okay. How many of you know any of them? Yeah. I know a couple of them. And some of them you're going to invite and they're going to blow you off. By the way, and I might get this wrong, there's two different groups. They're competing churches and they're not believing in Jesus the way we do, so I'm not going to mention their names. 
but their concept is we will knock on a thousand doors to get one response. When was the last time the Church of Jesus Christ was willing to knock on a thousand doors to get one person to show up? By the way, within a half mile of us, there are 10,000 doors. And there's 350 being built right over there right now where they're starting to. Pastor, you've laid out a lot of problem, but not a lot of answer. Here it is. One, start on your knees. Start on your knees praying for your pastor, your board, the church, and the mission of the church. Stay on your knees and ask the Lord, who's the one more? How many of you know I'm a movie fan? Long ago, there was a movie, and it's not a Christian movie. Patrick Swayze is the lead character. And the movie's called Roadhouse, which means bar. And my wife just had an apoplectic fit going, you quoting Roadhouse? Yeah, I'm going to. <laughs> because we're desperate. I don't sit for all script. I can't get back on if I wanted to. And he's a bouncer in a bar. And the guys came up and said, well, what if they call my mom a bad name? And his answer is, be nice. Be nice. <laughs> Well, what if they call me a bad name? Be nice. be nice. Well, how will I know when you when to not be nice? He says, you won't. That's my job. See, what he's saying is, don't go at it from the standard view of you're going to pick your time, your place, and your who. Go from God's view. God's the bouncer. God's the one in charge. And God will tell you. Invite. Make a goal of inviting three people a day. You're not going to make it some days. I get that. But you invite enough people, eventually they're going to come. I'm going to tell you right now, there are some people who have come into this church that I never thought would be here. But I invited them. And some of them I've invited a dozen times, and I'm farther away than ever. How many of you can say amen to that? Amen. How many of you invited people and you're there farther away than ever? It's going to happen. I had a pastor friend tell me, you're going to your first assignment. My brother lives near there. I said, good. What's his name? I'll go visit. <laughs> He says he won't come. His job will prohibit him. I was there for six and a half years. His brother came three times. Mm -hmm. Well, Pastor, do you realize that's one time or that's three times in 156 Sundays? More than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he came once. And when he came once, I gave him a hug. He really didn't like that. He almost hit me. <laughs> I shook his hand. If we pray, if we listen to God, and if we invite without discrimination. Pastor, you can't say discrimination. That's terrible in this, in this culture. It's not discrimination. It's just that we look at people and say, oh, they won't come, so we don't ask. That's discrimination. Well, Pastor, I've asked that. How long ago? If it's more than six months, ask them again. How many of you had something traumatic happen in the last six months? Let's be fair. How many of you had something happen that was ugly in the last six months? And your situation changed. And that might be what they need. Or maybe they just need to talk to you. Maybe they're afraid of the church. How many of you have been burnt by the church? I'll tell you, I have as a layman and as a pastor. Because church is made up of people and people mess up. Making it easy for them sometimes is as easy going out for a cup of coffee and saying, hey, you know, I've been reading my Bible at such and such. And I, it made me think of you. Mm -hmm. Well, don't turn around and tell the story of the lepers. 
<laughs> Don't tell the story of the woman caught in adultery. But share with them. And then if they say something like, you know, I'm going through a hard time. I just lost my job. Ooh, can I pray? Dear Lord, bless them. Help them find a job. Brian, it works, doesn't it? That's why I'm standing here. It doesn't work quick, though, does it always? Nope. <laughs> Sometimes somebody's brokenhearted because they've lost something. A loved one. A relationship. And you're being there. The district superintendent has a saying. It's his motto. It's his life story. And here's what it is. Presence matters most. And sometimes presence is just being there. And God may put you there with that person, and you know that you're not going to be able to talk to them about the Lord. But if you're there and you build the relationship, eventually you can. I'm still working on that with five people right now. There are five people I'm dealing with right now who will not come to church. In fact, if I mention church, they are not very happy with me. I pray. Every so often I invite, and I'm there. And when I'm there, I pay attention to them. They become the important thing. I'm not going to church. Not even religion. It's 2020. What's your vision? Financially? We're hurt. Now, I'm going to be very blunt. Uh, for those that are on Facebook, we're going to say goodbye. We'll see you next week. And Kurt, you're going to take us off. Because I'm going to be very blunt.